Right. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about Gfira. It's an open source tool that aims to make the lives of developers easier. Developers who are building software on top of Kubernetes, of course. So, I'm Robert. I'm a software engineer at BlueShoe. We are building web applications on top of Kubernetes, applications that need to scale, that need to run reliably. And um, yeah, today I'd like to uh, introduce you to this open source project we started, I think, eight months ago, around that time. So let me first start with where we come from, what our motivation is, how our development environments and production environments evolved over time. And after that, I get into the cool stuff, the Gfira architecture. I'm actually one of those crazy people doing live demos, so uh, let's send a prayer to the demo gods that everything will go well. And um, some wrapping up. So we are building web applications. And of course, like everyone, we started out somewhere. And in the beginning, we were building monolithic web apps. And that worked out pretty well. We were building those monoliths for our clients. And over time, they grew and grew and became unmaintainable, the web apps. And so we decided at some point we need to shift our approach to a more service-oriented architecture, building microservices, like probably most of you did here, right? And during that time, we noticed that our development environment, the, basically the environment where we built our stuff, and the production environment, where it runs in production, they diverge, it became more and more different. And this is actually what I want to talk about first, how that diverged over time, and then we get into Gfira. I think it's much more clear than why we built the tool. So who knows about the 12 factors for app development? That's quite a few. That's cool. So I'd like to talk about dev prod parity. This, this is actually the point of Gfira and um, our, the products we built at BlueShoe for developers. So what is dev prod parity? It's about keeping the development stage, the staging stage, the production environment as similar as possible so that you don't run into environmental bugs or environmental mistakes you built into the software. Right? And in the beginning, we started out building our software on top of virtual machines. So we had everything in one virtual machine, our Postgres, so the database, the cache backend, and the actual application, all in one uh, VM. It was managed by Vagrant, and we were provisioning stuff through Ansible, Salt, maybe some bash scripts, who knows. And in production, it was Basically the same, we were using some image, Ubuntu image or something to run our stuff there. The main difference actually was that we distributed our application in production across multiple VMs, right? Everything else was kind of similar. And you see, I put two bars down here um, about the dev prod parity and the dev convenience. And let me tell you, this is not an objective measured thing. It's more a subjective, um, yeah, how I perceived how those metrics actually felt like. So after that, we were trying to get rid of some responsibility. Because when you're running a database, which is basically in charge of multiple millions of euro revenue, or even some really important processes of a company, I mean, I don't want to be like, responsible for that when I can just pay a couple of bucks for someone else who runs it then. So what we did is we bought software as a service, Postgres, Redis, in this example, just to let others manage the database, the cache backend. And in development, actually, we had still the same setup, right? Everything still ran in one virtual machine on the developer's um, laptop. And that was 
kind of okay. It was a bit different, more different than before, because like the connection worked a bit different with the service providers. And yeah, some more problems arose. But DevProt parity, Dev convenience are still kind of okay, I would say. And after that, Docker came. And we started containerizing our applications. Everything became much more lightweight, actually. So we don't have the heavy VM running on my machine. We actually use containers and have more like separation of concerns, which is quite nice. But what we do now is we are creating Docker Compose setups for development. And at some point, DevOps or operation thing, oh, the, we need some different things for our Compose setup in production. So we have for every environment a different Docker Compose file, which runs, which behaves slightly different. And you probably have more and more bugs due to yeah, differences in the environment. So the good thing actually here is you use the same technology, Docker Compose. But the bad thing is, what we actually felt is distribution is kind of difficult to do with Docker Compose. It's possible, of course. But when you try to spread your application across multiple machines and scale it up, run it reliably, at that point in time, it was kind of, kind of a mess, I would say. So um, our DevOps people were like, let's use Kubernetes. It's awesome, right? We can just scale our workloads. Everything runs reliably. And yeah, it's, it's really, really cool to run software in production. But what about development? Development now runs actually on Docker Compose. And we have production running on Kubernetes. And basically, we're doing the same thing twice, orchestrating our services in Docker Compose and orchestrating everything in Kubernetes again. We write customized files, Helm charts, whatever, you name it. And you, write, you orchestrate your services in Docker Compose just to run them in development. And you run into yeah, bugs, into errors due to the different environments. The typical example for us is environment variables. Developers just say, like, I need a new environment variable in my container. I just add it to my Docker Compose setup. And DevOps doesn't know about it, doesn't add it to the pod definition, to the, to the container environment, and everything breaks. So we are thinking, why not do the same thing we did before with Docker Compose and run Kubernetes on our laptop? That's the solution, right? Nah, it's kind of difficult if you uh, are a Mac user as I am or even a Windows user, you know, on some operating systems, it's kind of difficult to run Kubernetes there. And it's not fun. I can tell you, like, when I start a Minikube or K3D on my laptop with certain workloads, I can fry an egg on this machine, really. I, I, I really hate it. This is actually why I, like, split the bar, because for the Linux users of my company, it was actually kind of OK to run Minikube and K3D, but for me, it was hell, really. So what we have now is a really, really good DevPod parity, because we were running Kubernetes distributions uh, on the local machine, in production, and staging, which is kind of nice, right? But it's kind of hard. As a developer, I have to know now how to set up Minikube, how to set up KTG, how to provision the cluster. Maybe I have to know about how to configure S3 in my local Minikube, and it's like, it's really, really hard. So this is actually where Gfira comes in. And Gfira allows you to take a container, which runs locally on your machine, and connect it to the cluster. And the connection actually works both ways. So your service behaves as, as it would be running in the cluster. And it can talk to the other services, to the other pods in the cluster. It can, uh, and the other services actually can talk to your service. And it's pretty lightweight, because I'm running just this one container on my machine. Or maybe if you're working on two services or three at once, you can all run all three in your, on your machine and connect them with Gfira to your cluster. And the idea actually is that you have some kind of remote development cluster for your dev team or even 
per developer if you have enough money for that, but uh, that you only work like you have separations of concerns, right? You're just caring about your application, you want to write features, you want to fix bugs. That's actually what we try to aim for here. And this is the best dev port parity and dev convenience I have seen in the last eight years. So what is Gfira? I already told you it works on a container basis. And you take an image which is available on your local machine or maybe in a Docker registry somewhere, and you execute it, and you can basically yeah, connect it to the cluster. What you also can do, which is kind of cool, you can replace workloads in the cluster. So let's say you have a deployment which runs three pods. You can just say, let's replace the containers in those pods with a, my local container, right? And that's just kind of amazing because like, you can debug services in your staging system in like production-like environments. You can also mount the code, um, which is on your machine, to the container. It's kind of a Docker run on steroids, if you want to see it that way. Uh, and some frameworks, um, mostly we're using Django or Flask or something, have like hot code reloading, also like Webpack and that stuff. Um, you can benefit from that. So you have like live code reloading in the cluster. It's like, so it's really cool. And another thing I really like about it is we can copy the environment from a certain workload in the cluster. So let's say I have a front-end pod which has certain environment variables set. And I just tell Gfira, when you run this container, copy the environment variables into this container so they're available to my application. And I don't really need to think about which environment variables have been set by ops and have to copy them manually, Gfira does that for me. That's kind of neat, actually. So how does this kind of black magic actually work? Let me tell you, this is just a rough sketch on how Gfira works. There are more details to it, just to give you an idea. So we have my, look, my machine here, the development machine, uh, which runs an application in a Docker container. And we have a Kubernetes cluster somewhere, which has a namespace, some pods in it. And um, now we want to connect them. And what we need to do first is we need to run Gfira up, which installs uh, certain components in the cluster. Firstly, or mainly, it's the operator, the Gfira operator, which runs in the Gfira namespace. And um, what we actually do is when the connection is lost or something goes wrong, Gfira cleans up after itself. It restores the original state of the cluster, which is kind of important because there are other development tools who don't do that. So when we're connecting the cluster with our local machine, it's done uh, with WireGuard, it's a VPN solution. And of course, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so we need two endpoints. And the endpoints are the cargo and the stowaway. That's how we call them. And Think of the cargo as kind of a gateway for our application into the cluster. So everything our application does, our requests, is routed through the cargo to the stowaway, and then you can resolve like domains, cluster domains, and services within the cluster. This is roughly how it works. There are some more details to it, but this is the, the rough architecture. If you really want to dig into the details, it's every, everything is described on the Gfira documentation online. OK. So now it's demo time. Um, I set up a pretty simple demo. Uh, I got my laptop here. Um, I got a Kubernetes cluster online, which has two pods. There's a front-end pod, and there's a back-end pod. The back-end pod basically has like one route. It's a web, web app with one route, which just gives me a JSON document with a color green. Or maybe I think it's blue right now. But JSON document with a color doesn't matter. And the front end requests the color from the back end, generates a HTML paragraph with a background color, and re returns it to my browser. That's, that's basically how the demo, demo works. So let's have a look at that. Can I move this Zoom thing? Oh, yeah, it works. Cool. All right. 
So this is the cluster running online somewhere, and it's hardly readable. It says, hello world, and blue color. Does that work? Yeah, it does. Great. So let's set up the console here. Cube control get pot. Oh, yeah, I need to update the plugin, of course. So we see we have the backend pod, we have the front end pod, they're running, and there are some restarts because I really practice this demo a lot. Um, so let's have a brief look at the code, what we're doing here. Um, this is the backend app. It's just a simple Flask application which returns the color. Nothing fancy, really, as promised. And this is the front end application which takes an environment variable. It's the service URL to the backend. It's the internal cluster service URL. And uh, does a request there, takes the color out of the JSON, generates the paragraph. Pretty simple, right? So this is what happens there. And let me first start with, um, we, we run the front end app on my machine and it retrieves the JSON document from the backend pod in the cluster. So here we go. Let's see if Gfira is actually set up. Status. So Gfira is not running. I have to start it first. Does that work? Yeah. OK, so now Gfira creates a local uh, Docker network, which basically wraps the cargo and the application into like one network, and then you can use the cargo as the gateway there. It's installing the operator before creating the Gfira namespace in the cluster. The stowaway comes up, and right now we have a Gfira namespace in the cluster here. Cool, that worked. So now I'd like to take the front end image and run it, right, with Gfira. So let's head to the front end folder and build the image. This is the back end for later. Oh, let's just go here. OK, this was, that was quick. That worked. Mm. Is that better when I put it up there, or is it OK when it's down there? It's OK? Cool. Um, so let's run, run that with Gfira. And just to make clear what I'm doing here, I'm using the help command, and also that I don't forget anything. So let's do Gfira run with the image. How did I call it? I think it was Gfira. KCD front end. Um, let's give the container a name, KCD front end. Um, we don't need to overwrite the command. No, it's a default namespace running. Oh, let's let's hook the code right in. That's uh, that's actually quite cool when we got uh, our code mounted into the container. What is it? Gfira demo, right? Yeah. It's the front end into slash app. That's where it runs. We expose the port. I think it's 5003. Um, and we remove the container when it's done. And we copy the environment because remember, uh, the front end is using the URL of the backend service to make the requests. So we use end from, and we have this typical Kubernetes notation pod slash front end. And here we go. OK, it says it's running. Let's go. 5003. There's the front end. OK, the front end is running now on my machine. But does it actually connect to the back end? Let's have a look at it. Um, KCDF was the container name. And bash, interactive. There it is. And let's have a look about the environment variable. So there it is. Actually uses the Kubernetes domain 
to request the color from the backend service which runs in the cluster. And the front end is now running on my machine, right? I can just like change code. Let's say I go into the front end app. What is the back end? Sorry. Hello, KCD. And let's make it an H1. OK. Here we go. Works. So my machine connects to the back end. <laughs> thank you, thank you. OK, but that's like the less cooler part. The really cool part is bridging. So let's have a look at that. Um, let me just stop that container, kcdf. All right. And let's do the whole thing with the back end. So the idea is we're bridging the back end in the cluster and the front end, which still runs in the cluster, requests the color on my machine. Right? So let's go there. Let's build the whole thing. Just that. Let's call it. There's the zoom thing here in front. I have to move it, sorry. Back end. All right, it's built. Now we need to run it first. So let's run down the whole thing. So basically, it's more or less the same I did before. I just take the backend image, I mount the backend code, and I have another port uh, forwarded. Nothing, nothing much more, just to save some time. So this one started. So let's have a look. There's the local host, 5002, with a color green. So it returns the color green, and of course, Nothing really changed on the cluster yet, because I didn't bridge. So now um, we bridge our locally running container to the backend pod in the cluster. So let's do that. Gfire up bridge to the help to make it a bit more. Uh, right, let's go. Did I? What was the name of the container? Because I just uh, yeah, here KCB. There it is. Right, that's the that's the bridge. So we use the backend container in the backend pod. The bridge needs a name. Actually, where there's an open uh, issue to generate the names automatically, so you don't have to put them in. If you want to help us, feel free. Our repo is uh, tagged with Hectoberfest, so you can benefit from that. Um, so it's the Gfira backend bridge. Um, we have the port 5002. And um, of course, we want to go to the pod called backend. So that everything is the default namespace. We have the port. It should be it. Oh, I uh, forgot to actually call the command bridge. OK, now GFIRA is establishing the bridge and basically intercepting the backend pod in the cluster, right? So when we look at this now, change to green, right? This is kind of cool. <laughs> and just, just to, to show off a bit more, when you're changing the color right now here to pink. Did I, did I mount the volume, actually? I did not. Did I? Oh, I for, forgot to mount the volume, so I don't have hot code reload. Um, do you want to see it? Yes. Yes? OK. So let's uh, just unbridge. So we basically restore the, oh, of course, I forgot the flag. Um, restore the original state. Let's stop this container here. And let's run it again with the volume mounted, actually. This is a bridge. Oh, I. Ah, it was there. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. My bad. Oh, uh, I didn't remove the container, so let's remove that. I didn't add the rm flag to the run command, so have to do it manually. So it's running again. Bridge. 
bridge it again. Here we go. I think I totally forgot to uh, say that. Jifara is the Greek word for bridge. I said it, I think it said it on one slide, but. Uh, all right, so now it's pink. And when I change it to whatever, green, what it was before, the online version changes the color depending on what code runs on my machine now. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I wasn't sure if this all works out, so I made the whole demo as with backup slides. So uh, we, we can just skip those. Um, that's basically it. Gfire allows you to run a certain workload, a container on your machine, and connect it to a Kubernetes cluster somewhere else. Um, it, the cluster can also run locally if you want that. I don't want that. I told you why. Um, a development cluster is just amazing. You have just the same um, environment conditions, basically, when you, when you develop your application. We have hot code reloading for our frameworks we work with. I know most of the other frameworks have that as well. And you can actually use the tools you're familiar with. So you can just attach a debugger into the locally running container, right? This is um, kind of neat. We don't need Docker Compose anymore, Vagrant, custom scripts, whatever. If you want to check out the demo, this link, um, and also check out GetDeck. I think my colleague Michael will lose some words about that tomorrow. It's a solution to take your production environment and make a development cluster out of it. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. I think we got a few minutes left for questions. If there are any, Oh, there are uh, quite a few. Um, hello. Oh, hey. Works. Um, so two years ago, I used to use uh, a tool called Telepresence. Yes. And it looks pretty much similar. Could you name a few differences, and how do these tools differentiate? Well, I cannot name a lot of difference, because it's uh, kind of similar. Actually, Telepresence was the original inspiration for Gfira. And actually, Gfira is part of the Uniq platform, which we're building, which is more an enterprise approach to do the whole thing. So there's a workflow given and stuff. But Gfira and GetDeck will stay open source. Um, so we actually use telepresence in our like, enterprise solutions. And it failed all the time. It was kind of unstable. And at some point, we hated it so much, we started Gfira. That's the short story, really. Right? So I think Telepresence has some more features when it comes to like providing preview um, systems and stuff. But um, I mean, we're getting there. Our project is growing. So thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question. Could you possibly, now or in the future, attach persistent volume claims to local containers? So um, to local containers. So basically, um, the container is switched right into the pod that's running online. So it should be, should be there as soon as you bridge it. OK, so I can access the data in my yes. PVC. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, wait. Yeah, just uh, one question about maybe an additional use case. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you use a, a Git pod or code spaces, you typically do not have VPC access, and that was a little bit one of the challenges, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if this use case also working for, let's say, using a cloud IDE, like Git pod, yeah? Yeah, so um, this is kind of on our roadmap, to be honest, okay. but we haven't had any, put any work into it, because like, so you saw the CLI is, it's uh, a bit, how to say, there are a lot of parameters you have to put in, right? And we try to improve the developer experience. We're right now building a VS Code extension and a Docker desktop extension. And as soon as we're done with that, we can talk about um, like browser-based IDEs and stuff. Is that, does that answer your question? Or? But it should work, shouldn't it? I mean, maybe not perfect experience, but it should work. I could not think of any reason why it's not working. 
So let's say I'm developing locally on my notebook, right? Yes. And I use now um, Gfira, right, yeah. to access, for example, a private database which is running in AWS. Yes. Should work. Right? That that should work. But does like um, Git pod do they execute the pod on your machine? I don't think so, right? No, it's a cloud. I don't see the pod. Yeah. You don't see the the environment, but you can execute. Docker run commands on your Git pod environment. Okay. So you could run Gfira and connect to it to your VPC and have yeah. full access to your, I mean, you connect to your cluster, but then have indirectly full it VPC access, I guess. It could theoretically work, but I think there would be some hassles involved. So uh, let me just t uh, tell you a brief thing. We talked to the Git, uh, Git pod people uh, in May, and we tried it like live on their on their booth uh, on a on a conference there and it didn't work okay. so there there were kind of some hassles involved and i think there's still some, there are still some steps to go but theoretically it could work yeah i think we can take one more <laughs> hey uh, cool tool um, Thank you. Is it also possible to run an application on my host system and bridge it into the cluster? For example, I want to run stuff from my EDE and run a debugger on it without attaching it. So, so basically, um, you just execute a container like locally, right? No, no, I mean without a container. Without the container. So my oh, backend okay. is running on my host and bridged into the cluster. Is that possible? So that's not possible with Gfire. Per se, so you need the container because the container. We basically patch the gateway mechanism of the container, so it uses the cargo, right? And we would have to do that with your application or some even with your host system. With some port forwarding, uh, maybe. Yeah, some that's trickery. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, some trickery. You just call it that, yeah. So I, it could potentially work. I think it's a good inspiration for further development, but right now it's not possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to swap speakers. So if you want to meet Robert, he's still around. I'm, I'm at the booth there, right? Um, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, it. And yeah, see you soon.